Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this meeting. Can I please ask members to appoint a chairman for the meeting, please? Ivor Heslop. Happy second that. Councillor Hislop, can you confirm if you get this? Uh, there we go. Right, yeah. Thank you. Right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the local review body meeting of Wednesday, 28th of April. Uh, could we have said an apologies, please, Tracy? Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, I can confirm that the meeting is core and all five members are present. No apologies, Chair. Ah, um, do any members have declarations of interest? I take that as a no. Uh, move on to item four now, which is the application for low barn Maltoch farm Dunraget Stranraer. Tracy, are you taking us through this? Thanks, Chair. I'll just go through the, the notes for the meeting. Yes, thanks. So within your papers, members, you've got the index of contents, which includes the notice of review and the related documents, the report on handling and related correspondence. Observations of the appointed officer on the applicant's agent's notice of review. Comments of the applicant's agent on observations of the appointed officer. Planning application forms submitted on the 5th of November 2020 with associated plans and support and information. The decision notice from Dunfees and Galloway Council dated the 1st of February 2021. Relevant extracts from the Dunfees and Galloway Local Development Plan 2. Photos of the application site and locality and the new information which was submitted after the case was determined by the appointed officer. The grounds for refusal are listed within your report, which is one, that the proposed development fails to meet any of the criteria in Dumfries and Galloway Local Development Plan 2, Policy H3, which only permits the erection of new housing in the countryside in particular circumstances, and none of these circumstances apply in this case. As such, the proposal would represent sporadic residential development in the countryside, contrary to the provisions of the development plan as set out in LDP2, policy H3, and to associated LDP2 supplementary guidance on housing in the countryside, and two, that a bat and barn owl survey conducted by a suitably qualified surveyor has not been submitted in relation to the agricultural buildings, which would be demolished as part of this proposal to demonstrate that the buildings do not host bats and barn owls, which are a protected species or that mitigation is achievable if they are encountered in these buildings. The applicant has asked that the review be dealt with on the basis of an assessment of the review documents only with no further procedure. The applicant has also introduced new information which was not in front of the appointed officer when the application was determined. This new information appears in section 9 of the papers, pages 141 to 143. The applicant was asked to provide an explanation as to why these could not have been in front of the appointed officer when the determination was made, and the applicant's agent has not provided any meaningful reasoning to, for the introduction of this information. The grounds stated in the Notice of Review are that the applicant application relates to Brownfield Development LDP2 Policy H3 Housing in the Countryside. Beneficial redevelopment of a Brownfield site should be applicable to this application. Low barn Nutluck Farm has been redundant for a considerable period of time with all associated buildings falling into a state of disrepair. The Council should be promoting the util utilisation of redundant disused buildings. The application site is set in a rural location which is in a, a cluster of buildings including a cottage adjacent to the application site. The farmhouse has been renovated and the conservation of the setting is ongoing. A bat and barn owl survey does not need to be submitted at this stage. If approved, a full planning application will be submitted in due course with the bat and barn owl survey. This can be subject to a condition. No neighbours objected to the proposal. The planner has predetermined the case. The land is not agricultural. The former farm is redundant. The proposed dwelling house has a modest footprint and cannot be described as substantial. 
You've also got a list of your development plan policies listed there on pages 125 to 133. So the main issues for the local review body to consider are do members wish to take the late additional post-determination information submitted into account when assessing this review case? And so do our members would need to be satisfied that there was sufficient reasoning as to why this information could not have been submitted when the application was determined by the appointed officer? Does the proposal accord with LDP2, policy H3 and associated supplementary guidance? Are any of the relevant criteria within that policy met? Does the proposal represent the beneficial regeneration of a brownfield site as defined in LDP2? If members conclude that the proposal is contrary to the terms of LDP2, in this regard, are there any other material considerations which would justify a decision which would represent a departure from the terms of the development plan? And if so, on what grounds should such a decision be made? Do members agree that a, barn and bar, a bat and barn owl survey requires to be submitted in relation to the proposal at this stage? Are members satisfied that the comments provided by the case officer to the agent on the 11th of November 2020 represent pre-application advice and that the case has been fully assessed within the published report on handling? So having outlined the documents within members' papers, it now falls to the local review body to determine whether it has sufficient information to consider the review. It's confirmed that no representations from any party will be heard today. The options available to the local review body are that it can decide it has sufficient information before it to enable it to determine the review today, request further information in the form of written representations. The local review body will be required to state precisely the information it's seeking and who must provide it. Resolve to hold a hearing, again specifying who will be invited to speak and on what matters or resolve to hold a site visit, accompanied or unaccompanied. This can be done in conjunction with any of the above, but would obviously not allow a decision to be made today. If the local review body resolves that it has sufficient information and that no further procedure is required, then the local review body has the full powers to uphold, reverse or vary a determination. The decision notice will include a statement of the terms in which the planning authority had decided the case reviewed. Planning advisor is present at your meeting today. It's confirmed that they have not had any involvement in this case and were not the case officer or the appointed officer for this application. They are purely here to provide independent advice as needed on matters of planning policy, law or process to the local review body. So if members are clear and no further clarification is required, I'll ask the chairman to lead the debate in the first instance to, reach, to take the local review body through the agenda papers and decide if it has sufficient information to make a determination today. Thank you, Chair. Hi, right. thank you, Tracy. Uh, if we go to item four, I think one of the first things that we were asked to clarify is, are we willing to accept the late information that was supplied by the agent um, to take it into account and the reasons given for that? Now, my understanding, no reasons, I think, when I was reading through that, were given for that. Do any members have any views on this? Sorry, I, I, I just don't, uh, Matt, I just don't think that there's any additional information in the in the extra paper uh, information. I don't think there's anything extra there. So, as I say, I would, I would, I would disregard it. Is anyone otherwise minded? I don't see any hands up. So we'll just disregard that uh, additional information then. Um, if we go through the papers, listed documents, um, notes of review, are members content that there's sufficient information in there? Yes. Report on handling. Is there any information that you feel is missing in there, or are you content that there's sufficient information there? Don't see any hands up. Um, observations of the appointed officer on the applicant's agent's notice of review.
No hands up in that one. I take it that everyone's happy. Um, comments of applicant's agent on observations of the appointed officer. No hands up. Uh, planning applications form submitted on 5th of November and associated plans and supporting information. No hands up. Decision letter from Dumfries and Galloway Council dated 1st of February. The Item seven is a relevant extracts from the Dumfries and Galloway Local Development Plan two. Then we have the photos of the application site in the locality. Councillor Martin. Can we get the photos up on the screen if possible? Because I'm not very clear on that. Papers. No problem, we can do that. Yes, uh, Councillor Drysdale. Yeah, I'm probably preempting that. I think it's a good request. I just wondered if they'll, I suppose I should wait to see, but it'd be helpful if they were in colour as well in the actual meeting. Thanks, Chair. Right, yeah. Uh, and we're not taking the new information submitted into account anyway. So, are all members happy that we have sufficient information in front of us today? to determine this application? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right, we are. Now, I think, Mr Sutty, are you taking us through the photographs of the site? Uh, good morning, Chair. Yes, uh, these are exactly the same photos as you have in your papers on page 137. 140, but uh, I'll lead you through those. So the first one on the screen, basically you've got the, the submitted block plan showing the position of the dwelling house in red. You'll note that the, there are two buildings there uh, outlined in black, which are the ones which are proposed to be demolished. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the fact that the southern, the lower building there, which would be demolished, is only for the erection of the garage on the same site. You'll note that the, the footprint of the proposed new house sits entirely within the field, not on the, the grounds of any of the demolished buildings. And the next slide, if that can come up please, is just an aerial photo of uh, the same area. You'll see the existing buildings and then the fact that that's a, an open field at uh, present. And the next slide shows the, um, one of the, the two existing buildings which would be demolished. These were uh, photos, I understand, which were provided by the, the applicant and agent. And the next one shows the, the second, the northernmost of the, the buildings which would be uh, demolished as well. Neither of these buildings, you note, are proposed for conversion. They're both just for, for demolition. And then the next photo shows uh, a slide northwards where the buildings on the right hand side are the ones which are the subject to a separate permission for a steady conversion. Uh, so it's really just the two buildings on the left hand side you're looking at would be demolished. And the final slide is one which is uh, taken looking from the public road where you can see the, the rear elevation of the, the two buildings which would be demolished and part of the field where uh, the proposed house is shown on indicative drawings as being erected. Thank you, Chair. Do any members have any questions with regard to the photographs? Any points you would like to raise? Don't see any hands going up. Um, go to the uh, recommendation of the officer is to refuse this on the grounds that uh, it doesn't form part of uh, a small building group or the other points put in under H3. Any members otherwise minded? Uh, 
Chair. Councillor McClelland. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. The, I think it's probably worthwhile having a discussion whether we agree or not for this site to be a beneficial redevelopment of a brownfield site. Um, that appears to be the agent's argument uh, in respect to the review. Um, from what I can read and what I can gather, uh, I'm certainly swayed towards this being a beneficial redevelopment of a brownfield site. These, uh, uh, the farm is disused. These buildings are uh, in a state of disrepair and will only get worse. Um, I realise fully that it's not a conversion, but the buildings will be demolished and the brownfield site will be redeveloped. So I'm of the opinion, having read the papers, that I would lean towards the applicant and his position that he believes this is beneficial redevelopment of a brownfield site. Thanks for that. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. I would tend to agree with Councillor McClellan's points. I've read the papers with interest and to me it looks to be potentially a more attractive development in what was originally quite dilapidated buildings. The one question I would really like to ask of Mr Suti, if possible, is at what point do we have a BAT and I'll survey? Would that not be normally once full planning is applied for, should this go through, or is it normal procedure for a BAT and owl survey to be done at this stage? If I could just have clarification on that, please, Chair, I'd be most grateful. Thank you. Mr Sutty, could you answer that point, please? Uh, yes, Chair. Basically, the, there is quite long-standing case law on this that uh, because these are protected species, you can't attach a uh, suspensive condition. So the advice is uh, given by the appointed officer in your papers that you would need to uh, basically, if you're minded to support the application, you would need to defer to get uh, such surveys done before further consideration. If I can provide some assistance in terms of the brownfield issue, it is clearly explained in your papers that uh, in terms of local development plan two, brownfield excludes agriculture. So really the, the purpose of a brownfield site here, this is not a brownfield site in, in planning terminology. Um, basically that is used mainly for, for example, for previous agricultural, sorry, uh, industrial uses which have taken place in open countryside, which have then um, caused significant degrading of the land, and this is to remove them. And just clearly the, the bit of advice as well, that if the concern is the appearance of the buildings, there would be no real impediment on the buildings being demolished, but that in itself is not justification for the erection of a house on the field, which is exactly what's uh, before you today just so long as members are quite clear about those two issues. Could I maybe have a bit of clarification as well? In the report at paragraph 4.4 .4 on page 38, uh, you read the sentence, excludes agriculture, forestry and previously used land, which now has nature conservation or recreation value. Does that mean that the agriculture and forestry land also have to na have nature conservation and recreation value, or is it just pure agricultural land that is of an issue? Um, because it could be read either way. Chair, I, I think the comma is actually quite important there. It ex excludes agriculture, comma, forestry, comma, and previously used land that has now nature conservation. To, so I think there's three distinct things. That's the way that it was written and always meant to be interpreted. So agricultural use is excluded from being brownfield. Thank you for that. Um, and I think the other important thing is the actual development isn't taking place on the brownfield site. Am I correct with that interpretation? 
the drawings before you are um, for the purposes of the, um, the elevations and the floor plans, I know are marked as indicative, but the basically if you were to approve planning permission principle, given the level of detail that's been provided for this application, it would be very difficult to then argue that you hadn't accepted the principle of the erection of a house in the field. Well, we have a motion, I think, to uh, proposed by Councillor McClelland, seconded by Councillor Drysdale to um, overturn the decision of the officer and approve the application. Councillor Martin? I would just like to go with the officer's recommendation because once we've been explained what, what the Brownfield site, it's not past the Brownfield site. I don't think it, as the officer says, it doesn't, it doesn't meet any of the considerations. Uh, I must admit, when reading this, the actual size of the site, which includes more of the greenfield, I would actually have to support uh, Councillor Martin on this. I would second Councillor Martin on this proposal. Right, Tracy, I think we're ready to go to the vote. Oh, Councillor Ferguson. OK, so I suppose the $64,000 question is, uh, do we leave it in a dilapidated state or do we allow a development on it to, uh, to make it better? Um, and to quote my old colleague from uh, Newton Stewart, uh, these things are only here to enslave us. Um, I'm, 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 I'm wondering here is, you know, what, we're not here to re revisit the, uh, the planning application per se, we're here to look at the process I think I'm right and correct um so have we no so I, I think my, my quandary here is if we look at this as an individual uh, application which we are bound to do right um uh, I'm kind of a mind that I'd rather see um, a new building there than a whole ser series of dilapidated buildings but whether that's legitimate enough um, to overturn the officer's recommendation. I'd be interested to hear what David has to say on that. Mr Sutty. Sure. Um, obviously, the, the application um, is for um, the erection of a dwelling house. The application is not before you for the demolition of agricultural buildings that are causing an eyesore, if you see what I mean. It's, it's specifically for planning permission principle for the erection of the dwelling house. The drawings show the house being erected in the field. If your concern is the condition of existing agricultural buildings, which I have to say don't appear to me to be uh, particularly poor, there are many worse examples throughout Dumfries and Galloway. There is no impediment subject to the applicant putting in the, the usual applications to have those buildings removed that would enhance the appearance, but in itself, that does not form justification for the erection of a house in, in the middle of a field. Um, Councillor Martin, I noticed your hand up, but it's back down. Did you want in at this point? No, it's fine, sir. I think it's just clarified here. Right. Councillor Drysdale? Yeah, thanks for letting me back in, Chair. Thanks, David, for the clarification. I have to say I was a little bit confused looking at page 83 and on the screen today with the plans themselves, David. On my plan, it says that the house will be built in garden ground. So I suppose I have missed it in the papers as to where it I must have. And I, I kind of think I possibly have seen it. Could you guide me, David, as to where it actually says the field? Because on the plan, it says garden ground. So is that incorrect? Thanks. Uh Sure, yes, if I can help. Lara, would it be possible to go back to the, the second slide in, which is the aerial view? Right, uh, as you can see, that is an agricultural field. When it says garden ground, that is the proposed garden ground for the proposed house. It is on an agricultural field at the moment, which is also rated as 3.1 under the Macaulay 
uh, institute, so therefore it's regarded as good quality agricultural land which should not be lost. So it's not being erected on the, a garden ground, it's on a field. I hope that's clear. That's clear, thank you. I suppose I feel I've been slightly, it's become slightly complicated because of that issue itself, David, and I don't know if there's anything in the papers that there probably is and I've missed it that says that. So we pro I probably should have taken that into account, but nevertheless, I shall stick with my initial comments. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. All right, Tracy, I think we have a motion and amendment. Um, have you grounds sufficient from Councillor McClellan just uh, for the reason for going against policy, the material grounds? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I was just going to come in and ask um, Councillor McClelland and Drysdale if they could confirm. So uh, what I've noted down is that they would want to reverse the decision of the appointed officer and approve planning permission in principle, which would be an exception to policy, and I would need the grounds um, as to why it was beneficial for the, the development of a dwelling house in that location against policy that it's already been determined against. So I would need those grounds from the proposer and seconder, please. Councillor McClellan, Councillor Drysdale. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I'll come back first if that's if that's OK, uh, yeah. Pauline. The, yeah, I, as I stated, I believe that this this is um, the. Uh, just lost my page here. I had a note. Just excuse me a second. Got too many yellow stickers here. Yeah, I, I firmly believe it is a beneficial redevelopment of a brownfield site, and the the justification of that it says uh, at page thirty eight it states excludes agriculture, agriculture, forestry, and previously used land which is now uh, which has nature conservation or recreation value, and then in it goes on to reflect Plan and Advice Note Plan 73, which states in Terralia that brownfield sites and rural activities are defined as land that has been significantly degraded by a former activity. And I, I believe the determination of the beneficial redevelopment of brownfield site is such that that land has been degraded due to the deterioration of these of these buildings. Um, and that is my justification that uh, I firmly believe that we are not in contradiction of the guidance. Chair, um, I believe that the plan advisors advise, um, advise members that it's not a brownfield site. I think that's the sort of issue that the actual house is in a green field and part of the site is located on the to be determined brownfield area. Councillor Martin, I noticed you. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. Just summed up what I was going to say there. We've been told that it's not a brownfield site. So, is that, is that uh, the, re the reasoning for the Henry's, uh, Henry's uh, motion? Is that competent? If we've been told it's not a brownfield site. Mr. Sutty, would you like to comment on whether it's. Uh, Forms uh, ultimately, it's. I'll not say competent or not. That's. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that, that, that I was going to say that's that's something which would have to rest with the, the clerk. But uh, I'm looking at the moment at the the council's adopted um, supplementary guidance on housing in the countryside, and looking at um, the definitions of rural brownfield sites on pages ten and eleven, paragraphs five point one to five point three. I am satisfied that this is not a brownfield site. And therefore, uh, personally, my view is that it, it couldn't be taken to be a competent motion in that if you're going to be wanting to erect a house in an open field, if the grounds are that it, it's going to lead to the beneficial redevelopment of a brownfield site and it doesn't meet the planning definition of brownfield, uh, my own view is I, I don't think that could be taken as being compliment, um, competent, I'm afraid. Chair. Councillor McClellan. Yeah, if um, if that's the case, and I think I have to 
withdraw my motion if it's deemed not to be competent, so I'll withdraw. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. May I come back in and just ask David if it's acceptable to ask the following question. Should this developer come back again, if that's allowed, on a completely separate application and present these plans, maybe possibly slightly reduced, but not into the agricultural land area with a BAT and owl survey, might that be an alternative or can that not be discussed at this particular meeting? I'm sure it probably can't, but I just want to check. Thanks, Chair. Mr Sutty, my understanding usually is that every application is treated on its own merits, but that would be an option for the applicant if he wished. Uh, indeed, and obviously you've got to determine the, the review that's before you today. The, the decision has already been issued under delegated powers to refuse it, and you've got, you're have got you reviewing that decision today. Um, and therefore, it's, in terms of hypothetical applications, which may or may not come forward, uh, I would have to advise that you can't really look at that today, I'm afraid. Okay, I come okay. back. Uh, okay, Chair. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, David. Well, I will go with withdrawing my motion as well, and but wait as well to see what Andy Ferguson says. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Ferguson. Um, uh, thanks, Ivor. I, I think I've got a sympathy here with the, with the, uh, the applicant, but uh, circumstances are dictating um, that uh, we need to go with the officer's recommendation here. Um, and I think uh, if I'm right here, they can uh, reapply a different setting of the house, but that's a totally separate issue, and I don't think it should come into your consideration today. So, um, I'm happy to go with the officer recommendations as uh, already been uh, proposed by John and seconded by you. Right. With that, Tracy, I think uh, there's a unanimous decision. Thanks, Chair. Yes, members have um, agreed to uphold the decision of the appointed officer and refuse the application. Right. We'll now move on to item five, refusal of applying permission for change of use and alterations to Church Hall to form dwelling house at Gospel Hall, Colonel Street, Patrick. Tracy, do you wish to take us through the notes? Thanks, Chair. So again, you've got your index of contents, which includes your notice of review and related documents, the report on handling and related correspondence, observations of the appointed officer and the applicant's agent's notice of review, comments of applicant's agent on observations of the appointed officer, the planning application form which was submitted on the 9th of November 2020, associated plans and support and information, decision notice from Dunfrey and Galloway Council dated 9th of February 2021, relevant extracts from the Dunfrey and Galloway Local Development Plan 2, photos of the application site, and again, you've got new information which was submitted after the case was determined by the appointed officer. The grounds for refusal and are stated in your papers are that the proposal is contrary to LDP2 policy CF1 part B, policy CF1 of LDP2, the development plan, and that the application has failed to demonstrate that this community facilitates surplus to the needs of the community or that there would be an overall community gain from the proposed development or that alternative provision has been made available at a suitable location within the local area. It is considered that the proposal is premature ahead of a period of further marketing, which would potentially serve to demonstrate a lack of demand within the local community to retain the building as a community hall, and thus that the building could be compellingly demonstrated to be surplus to the needs of the community. The applicant has asked that the review be dealt with on the basis of an assessment of the review documents only with no further procedure. The applicant has advised that sufficient information was provided. At the same time, the applicant has also introduced new information which was not in front of the appointed officer when the application was determined. This information appears in section 9 of your papers, pages 261 to 285. The applicant was asked to provide an explanation as to why these could not have been in front of the appointed officer when the determination was made. The applicant's agent has not provided any meaningful reasoning for the introduction of this information. The grounds in your notice of review are in summary. The decision is not transparent. The application complies with policy CF1. 
for some reason the planning officer has not given consideration to relative planning policies nor the fact of the other community facilities nearby in the village. The building will require a substantial upgrade for whatever the intended use may be. There is a, sort, a shortage of two to three bedroom properties in the housing stock in Perpatrick and surrounding area. Such properties would be a community gain, so should be made available to the community as affordable rented accommodation. The building is surplus to requirements in as far as a community asset, but can be brought back into very much needed housing requirements in the area, which follows government guidelines and strategies in bringing derelict properties back into use as houses for people. There are currently another two community halls in Port Patrick plus a harbour hub. The development will improve the character of the area, will blend into the social and private accommodation and will be of an appropriate size so as not to stand out from other buildings. Because it has laid empty for so long and in a state of disrepair, the renovation will not prejudice the character of the area but rather enhance natural build-up and culture of the area. Previous job to the hall being put on the open market it has been widely known that it was for sale or rent over the years. There has been interest shown, but nothing ever materialised from the interest. The planning officer took no notice of the information provided. I simply wanted the application refused. The applicant has now been to re-advertise that the applicant has now re-advertised for lease, which is saddening and can only be described as bullying, making someone lease or sell their own property. You've got a list of your development plan policies. And the main issues for the local review body to consider is, do members wish to take the additional late information, which was post-determination of the submitted into account when assessing this review? In doing so, members would need to be satisfied that there was sufficient reasoning as to why this information could not have been submitted when the application was determined by the appointed officer. Do members agree that the applicant has failed to demonstrate that this community facility is surplus to the needs of the community? Would the proposal give rise to an overall community gain? Is the proposal contrary to the terms of LDB2 policy CF1 Part B? Is the proposal premature in the sense that an inadequate period of marketing has taken place to demonstrate a lack of demand to retain the building as a community hall or other form of community facility? If members conclude that the proposal is contrary to the terms of LDP2 in this regard, are there any other material considerations which would justify a decision which would represent a departure from the terms of the development plan? And if so, on what grounds would such a decision be made? Having outlined the documents within your papers, it now falls you to determine whether you have sufficient information to consider the review today. No representations will be heard from any party. And as with the previous case, your options are to decide that you have sufficient information to enable you to determine the review today, request further information in the form of written submissions, resolve to hold a hearing, resolve to hold a site visit. And if, you, if the local review body resolves that it has sufficient information and that no further procedure is required, then you have the full powers to uphold, reverse or vary a determination. The decision notice will include a statement in the terms of which the planning authority has decided the case reviewed. We have a planning advisor here present and I can confirm that they have not had any involvement in this case and they were not the appointed officer for the application. They are here to provide independent planning advice as needed on matters of planning policy, law or process to the local review body. So I'll now ask the chairman to lead you through the debate and if you have sufficient information to determine the application today. Thanks, Chair. I think similar to the last one, uh, the first thing that we were asked to determine is whether we would accept the late representations and the reason given for them. Are members minded to accept them or refuse to uh, take them into consideration? Take it by silence, we're accepting them. Right, we are. We'll accept them then. Um, if we go through the representations, uh, through the papers, have we enough information with regard to the notice of review dated 17th of February? Yes. 
I think the report yeah. and handling. There's one question I have there. There is a redacted email on page 173. Now, the whole email was redacted. Was that just a case it wasn't relevant to this report? Or is there information in there that we should have had in front of us? Or is it just my papers that are redacted? At one? No, mine did as well, Ivor. Yeah, mine too, Ivor. Is it Mr. Robinson that's taken us through this one? It, it is, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I will just double check what it is. It's actually, I'm sure that email is published online on the case file, actually. And I'm pretty certain it's uh, an email from Mr. Robert Duncan. Um, I think it's been redacted because it's not actually relevant um, to the case, but I will. Um, I can just double check that for you. Apologies, my um, computer screen's just um, just frozen. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we wish to go on, members, through the next parts? And when, if Mr. Robinson can get that up, he can let us know later on. Happy to proceed that matter. Yeah, it's fine. So, uh, section three is the observation of the appointed officer and applicant agent notice of review. Are we happy with the information in there? No hands up, I'll take that as yes. Four comments of applicant's agent on observations of the appointed officer. No hands up. Part five, planning application form submitted on the 9th of November. No hands. Six, decision letter from Dumfries and Galloway Council dated 9th of February. No hand. Seven, relevant extracts from the Dumfries and Galloway Local Development Plan 2. Uh, the photos that are in here that Mr uh, Robinson will take us through later. Are we happy with those? And the new information submitted after the case was determined by the appointed officer. Right, so with that in mind, when we hear from Mr. Robinson with regard to that email, if his computer's unfrozen, um, do we feel that we have sufficient information in front of us to make a determination today? Yes. Yes. All right. Mr. Robinson, uh, were you able to find that uh, email? I have, Chair. Um, effectively, what it is, it's an email from um, Mr. Robert Duncan, as team leader, to the case officer, basically forwarding the information that was sent from the agents. The agent sent the um, supporting information um, to Mr. Duncan and Councillor Juicy, and then Mr Duncan forwarded that email to uh, Iona Brook, and that's really all the email is. Right, yeah, thanks. It does appear online on the case reference, but I'm assuming it's been redacted because it's not really relevant to, it doesn't add anything to proceedings. Right, yeah. Um, the photographs for the uh, application, if you'd like to Take us through those, Mr. Robinson. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Um, so the first um, slide, this is a view looking north um, and it shows the rear elevation of the Gospel Hall, which is on the right hand side. Um, 
And if you move on to the next slide, it shows the area where that previous photograph was taken. So this is a view looking north towards the uh, rear elevations of buildings to South Crescent, and it's shown lockup garages, um, which is to the rear of the Gospel Hall. I should add that this um, area of land isn't identified within the red line boundary that's been submitted with the application, so it's it's under a different ownership, presumably because it's also not been accompanied by a blue line on the location plan. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, this is taken from the front uh, street, uh, which is Colonel Street, and it's looking west towards South Crescent. So effectively, it's looking back towards where that previous photograph was taken. And the next slide shows the front elevation of the building, uh, which forms part of the application. And that's the last photograph that's uh, accompanying the, the slides. Right, members, any questions on the photographs? Councillor Drysdale. Thanks, Chair. Andrew, are you taking us through the layout, the internal layout as well today? Thanks. Uh, I can do that. They're not um, part of the slides, but they're actually within the supporting document. So I take it you're referring to the layout of the proposed dwelling house internally. I am. And well, I'm quite happy if you want. I just got a question about the internal layout, if that's acceptable, Chair. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. So Andrew, fine. I notice in the layout plans they are quite tiny, but that the bathroom in the new proposed plans will be at the far side of the house. In terms of planning, when somebody submits an application, and again, this is from my clarification, and they refer to it as a dwelling house, does that mean a dwelling house for local people, or can that be altered to become a holiday let or a holiday home or an Airbnb. My concern is just that the layout would dictate that it would look as if potentially it could become that because the bathroom is at the far side of both the bedrooms, which of course some people can live with, but it does raise its own design queries. So I'm just asking if it was this layout, will this be for a holiday home or is the word that is used in the document, um, what have they used, what is the word, sorry, it's gone from my head. A dwelling dwelling house would that remain as a dwelling house for local people it really is my question thanks thank you chair um at what's been applied for is a change of use to uh, a dwelling house which is a, a dwelling house that falls under class nine of the use classes order um effectively a holiday home um can be is is effectively a dwelling house and it could be used as a holiday home um, or it could be used as a, as a B&B, um, pro providing however many bedrooms are proposed, it doesn't exceed a certain number, which I think is is two, um, in which whether it would require planning permission. So what's in front of you is an application for a dwelling house, but that doesn't stop it from being used as a holiday home because that is effectively a still a dwelling house in, in under the use classes order. Thank you, Andrew. Andrew, could you advise me on what is deemed a commercial facility? I can chair, yes. Um, that's in the in policy CF1. I'm not sure if you've got the local development plan in front of you or, or where it is in the papers, but it's, it's essentially um it will be further down actually let me just find where so um section 34 it starts on page um page 251 of your yeah papers and i'm just seeing the section so um, this, it's actually in the supporting text in paragraph 490 of the um, lo of Local Development Plan 2. And in terms of commercial, it's um, stating that that would refer to um, like a shop or a supermarket or a public house or a cafe or a restaurant. So they're what are uh, listed as uh, commercial uses. Um, it might be useful for me to also run through what the other um, list is saying in the policy. So um, also what's 
defined as a community facility in terms of health would be hospitals, medical facilities, uh, recreational community facilities would be uh, sports halls, gymnasiums or health suites, uh, cultural uh, recreational uh, community facilities would be theatres, museums and libraries and other community facilities are included are church, community halls or post offices. So that is within the supporting text to policy CF1. Right, so just to get that, because it broke up a wee bit there for me. So is a church hall a commercial? No, it's just no. it's just listed as under other um, community facilities, so it's not it's not defined within a category. So do we have a specific time scale where non-commercial buildings have to be advertised for uh, not for use? Uh, community use? The, the count, the, um, there is a planning guidance on marketing and the from reading the case officer's report, um, the criteria to met in this case is the facility is surplus to the needs of the community and effectively a way to, to demonstrate that is, is through a, a marketing exercise and the planning guidance um, that's an, it's a non-statutory guidance it's been adopted as non-statutory guidance recommends 12 months for any marketing exercise to be undertaken right thanks for that Councillor Ferguson. Um, thank you, Ivor. Um, but in this instance, it's the members of the church who say it's no longer required, not the public. Am I right? Because it's not a public um, building as it is just now. It's, um, it belongs to the members of that church. So it's a closed membership. So does that year long uh, advertising period apply? I think that's the kind of point I was getting to as well. It's not a commercial business and it says quite well, my reading is mm -hmm. it's if it's a commercial one, you need at least 12 months. It doesn't actually specify for a uh, non-commercial. Mr Robinson. Yeah, um, just going back to what I said before that the, any marketing um, exercise that's undertaken, the period is for 12 months. Um, yes, it's the, the community um, saying the church are obviously saying that the, they don't need this building anymore, um, but it's still a community hall um, in, in the planning terms. So that's what the judgment has been made on. Councillor Ferguson, your hand's still up. Do you wish to come back? Uh, I think this is where we're coming into a bit of interpretation thing here because um, uh, if the church members uh, had objected, um, they would have objected to this. They clearly haven't. Um, and I don't think it actually meets the criteria here for requiring a, a whole year's uh, consultation. Um, I, uh, I'm kind of minded to, to agree with the applicant here or the, the appellant. Um, but it'd be interesting to see what others have to say first. Um, any other member wish to come in? Councillor McClelland. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking a similar line to Councillor Ferguson, uh, but I would also like to add that on page 251, the reuse of the existing community facilities, having accepted the additional information that uh, from section 9, there's clearly there uh, indications from various other community groups in, uh, in Port Patrick that they have no intentions of using such facilities and even one of the existing community facilities uh, actually hold wedding receptions. So I think there's support and information there that would uh, clearly add weight to the fact that uh, the facility is surplus to the needs of the community. So I am, I'm on the same lines as Councillor Ferguson, Chair. 
Yeah, I must admit, I'm similarly minded on the grounds that there are two other community halls within Port Patrick and the Harbour Hub. I suppose there'll also be a school uh, hall as well that could be used if required. Um, but Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to ask the question of the officer. You know, we're seeing smaller communities, for example, the Isle of Whithorn, Port Patrick, you know, being extremely quiet over the winter periods, as well as school roll numbers dropping and problems with teaching and probational teachers across the area while the school numbers drop. I take it we couldn't agree, I would agree with the other, yourself, Chair, and the other two councillors, but is it possible to put in a condition that it might just be for residential use rather than holiday properties, or is that an unacceptable proposal and crossing the boundaries? Thanks, Chair. Mr well, Robinson, yeah. is that able to be put in or would it be a case that you could put it in, but next week they could come and change it and ask for? Yeah, I'm 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 not convinced that, that you could put in a condition like that. What we would we have put in conditions the other way around. Um whereas if somebody's applying exactly for um let's say it's for holiday accommodation under the tourism policy and we've restricted it from being a dwelling house because that has been the case where there's a clear policy um there's been a clear policy justification where a house has tried to be being justified on the grounds of tourism but it would otherwise be unacceptable as a, as to be a permanent dwelling house in this case um this is a, an application that's seeking a dwelling house and i'm not I don't see what policy grounds that we would be able to attach to see why a holiday use would be unacceptable, given that we've actually got policies in the LDP that are actually quite supportive of, part of tourism uses. So uh, I wouldn't, I, I can't see what planning grounds in the LDP too that we would have for attaching that condition. Okay, thanks. That's fair enough. Thanks, Andrew. Councillor Martin. Thanks, Chair. No, I agree with much, much what's been said, like how we go with this application. But I would hope when the, uh, when it comes back, we get, it gets a proper roof net rather than the corrugated asbestos or iron that's on it just now. Yes, I think that'll be taken care of through uh, building control as well. It's a proper roof that's put on it. Um, Tracy, have you got sufficient reasons there uh, I think the feeling is that uh, the information provided with regard to additional halls show that it's surplus to requirement um, and that as an exception to policy we don't think it meets the commercial use so we think the 12 month rule could be uh, ruled out I think. Thanks Chair. Uh, yeah, so what I've noted down is that members were looking to reverse the decision of the appointed officer and approve the application on the grounds that um, taking into account the additional information at section 9, which members have agreed to accept, um, it's been demonstrated that there are other community halls and a harbour hub within the area and that there is no community need for this facility Therefore, it does comply with policy CF1 that it is surplus, surplus to the needs of the community. And because it's not a commercial property, the normal 12 month marketing period um, members consider would not apply in this case. Are uh, members happy with that? Fine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Looks and is there any conditions that members want to attach to this permission? Andrew, I would need to uh, attach those conditions at this stage, is that correct? Yes, that, that's correct. And I think if you are um, um, minded to go down the route of approving this, I would probably ask you to, ref to refer to the sections of the report, particularly on the design of the proposal. There's particularly been there's comments in the case officer's report about the ex external appearance of 
the conservation area, particularly the windows that are proposed. Um, it's obviously in this case, it's proposed that new UPVC windows and doors are proposed. The site is in a conservation area and the council's policies require proposals to preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. So you may wish to give to some consideration to that in terms of um, what you would be seeking in terms of an approval of this application, of whether you'd want to see details of the windows, for example, whether you'd want to go as far as stipulating a particular material to be used, for example. Um, so I would just refer you to that part of the um, of the case officer's assessment. Councillor Drysdale, then Councillor Ferguson. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, Andrew, I would definitely like to impose a condition. May I just, with regards to the windows, I think we miss a trick in Dumfries and Galloway with the colours that we use. I personally find the white not very attractive in small conservation villages. I think the new colours that are on the marketplace are far more um, in keeping with, you know, the look of especially seaside towns but and villages. So could we, do they have to be wood, Andrew, is what I'm asking? Are we looking at the High quality plastic or for Port Patrick, does it still have to be wood? But if either way, I would I would like a condition imposed so that we could, or whoever's on that next committee could see and approve windows that are in keeping with the area. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. You you can stipulate a material if if you um, wish to see timber sash and case. Um, you do have to have a bit of regard as to what is is in the. Area, conservation area at the minute, um, I would be more inclined that you, it, there, are, there appears to me, and I haven't actually visited the site, but judging from the photographs in the surrounding locality, there does appear to be quite a lot of UPVC windows, but at the same time, the policy does require a preserve and enhance. Um, I would suggest that if, if you are to accept UPVC windows, which is what is proposed in the application, that as a, as a minimum, that would be a slide in sash and case form, uh, which would at least have some sort of resemblance of a, tr of a traditional um, appearance. May, may I come back in, Chair? Council yeah. Drysdale. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would absolutely propose that we do do that. Andrew, I'm happy with the sash and case. Uh, UPVC, but you know, in keeping, as you say, there would need to be sash and case and potentially different, you know, the softer greys and blues and lighter colours considered because against that brick work, the grey brick work, the white is imposing and looks very industrialised. So, yeah, I would like that. And want if anyone could agree, I would be happy to put that condition in. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Andrew. Councillor Ferguson. Um, thanks, Ivor. Uh, I must have a, a sympathy. Um, this building's had the, those white windows for quite some time. Um, it, it, we haven't got any real clue, and I think Andrew um, is is candid enough with us to say that he's not actually visited the site. Um, I, I agree that we should have some sympathy for the uh, the area, but it's a personal thing. I think that that uh, Pauline's bringing forward here. I've got white windows in a 200-year-old sandstone house, um, and they have been quite um, for at least 150 years or thereabout. So, what in actual fact um, is the proper colour? Um, it's an aesthetic thing that uh, I'd be happier if we just had uh, the, the normal conditions apply that they have to work with the planning and building control to make sure that everything. I'm more worried about the roof, to be frank, um, than the windows. Um, and and uh, we need to then trust the officers um, uh, to come to an agreement with the, uh, the developer to make sure that this is a, a, a dwelling house fit for, uh, for humans um, uh, to live in. So I, I'm not too precious about being white or what colour as long as they are uh, sympathetic uh, to the area and would leave that very much to the officers to work out with the, the developer. And that would be my view. Okay. Councillor McClelland. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I think my, my view on this as well is that uh, I believe in terms of the windows that should be left as a delegated responsibility back to the officer to determine what the proposal actually is and get the finer detail. Um, because it's a conservation area, appropriate drawings, whether it's uh, 
the slide and sashing case, uh, etc. Again, that will be down to planning to determine with the applicant. So I think we should delegate that back and just leave the condition uh, as such that the planning officer will deal with that in respect of the requisite or the requirements of the conservation area with respect to anything else building building warrant will pick up on what's needed in terms of habitable requirements uh, for the change of use pauline are you quite happy that we delegate this to officers i think that seems to be the best way because whether uh, sliding sash and sash in case is a good one or whether it's a uh, windows way is it side hoppers or top hoppers uh, that would be best possible left to officers because there might be a different solution that suits better councillor drysdale thank you very much chair just so that i'm not causing any anomalies here and <laughs> offending anybody particularly yourself um councillor ferguson i don't wish to be rude i i also have white sash and case plastic windows in my house because they actually go with my property but as a council we are a bit behind with the new modern designs of sash and case and sliding and slit windows that are on the marketplace at the moment so but yes as long as delegated officers are aware of all the products available and we can move a bit more with the times and start to look like properties in other parts of the uk who are a bit ahead of the game we are behind in defleece and galloway with design not all the time but a lot of the time but yeah and for your property and for mine these white sash and cake of white windows were suitable but things have moved on especially in seaside properties but yeah i'm happy to leave it with officers chair and i take on point on board your points thanks mr robinson are you able to just uh, take that on board as standard conditions or yeah. specific because of maybe windows mentioned. Yeah, no, that that's fine. We, we've got uh, standard conditions that can require details of the external walls, for example, or the exact appearance. In terms of the roof, actually, what's proposed on the drawings? I was just having a look whilst you were in discussion there. Um, the submitted drawings are actually proposing fibre cement roof sheeting, but what a condition can do is actually require the exact details of. Um, the roof material and the same can go for the windows that um, a condition can be worded along the lines of no planning permission is hereby granted for the, the windows and it then requires details of the exact um, windows materials and um, the detail of the windows to be submitted for the approval of the council as planning authority which I would okay. suggest would be a, a way forward. Yeah, Councillor Ferguson. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for that, because uh, I'm all here for having a negotiated solution here between the developer and, and the planning and building control. So um, I'm happy what Andrew's just said there. Right. With that, are members happy to delegate to officers to come up with the standard uh, conditions so that we can actually take this forward? Happy Fine. to agree. Yeah, happy to agree. Sure. Fine with me. Right, so Tracy, I think we've come to a decision to uh, reverse the officer's decision on the grounds previously stated and to put standard conditions in place. Yes, thanks Chair, I've noted all that down. So the, the, the conditions will be included in the minute and they'll also be included in the decision notice that goes to the applicant as well. Right, yeah, right. Um, I have no other business. Can I thank you all for your attendance? Can I, Chair, can I just ask a question? Were we meant to have, was there a couple of mistakes of additional pages in page 263 or was that just for, I wasn't sure why that was in the document. As it was in my papers by mistake, it was a property for sale. It was, just, it was additional information that was supplied by the uh -huh. uh, applicant's agent with regard to a what was deemed community facility being for sale um ah. over and above he was given examples of properties that had different things but i don't okay. think there's any okay that's great thank you relevance okay. well chair diver thank you right yeah uh, right, thanks, thanks everyone, everyone. bye, bye. bye. bye.